Imagine, if you will, an American electorate so tired of politics as usual that they turn to the politics of unusual. So tired of candidates that are old that they turn to a candidate that is young. But just how young? Too young? How young is too young? Find out in the big present zone. That's a dangerous question, Eric. How young is too young? I don't think you ever want to be recorded asking a question like that. It's okay. This is an offbeat episode. Yeah. That's how you wind up. uh, Those are questions that that are asked uh, at Epstein parties. (laughs) Welcome to Fake Presidents, a real podcast about, well, you know. Each episode, we will take a deep dive into a fictional American president from pop culture to see just how much fiction there really is. I'm Eric Buckman, a former political consultant turned TV writer. Yeah, let's go with that. We'll say TV for now. And I'm Ben Oren, a former journalist, sometimes speech writer, and all the time TV producer. And in this episode, as you might have gathered from our brief sojourn in the cold openings, <laughs> on this episode, we're headed into the Twilight Zone. We are going to cover every fake president that's ever been in any episode or movie of the Twilight Zone. Which would be one. Which would be one. In 2019's The Wonderkind. Yeah, this episode we're about to talk about, by the way, without any credits, it's like 36 minutes. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really easy to watch. It's on freebie right now. So it's free. And if you've got Amazon Prime, it's even, even easier to watch. Just load up that Prime app and it's... It's more load, free. It's even more... I mean, you're still paying for Prime, but it's it'll load up free. within It'll load up within that app. So anyway, here we go into the Twilight Zone. My name is Andrew Shepard and I am the president. But because we're nothing, if not thorough, I feel like we should at least acknowledge the fictional portrayals of real presidents they've done oh. since there's only two. <laughs> um, let me guess. Van Buren and Buchanan. You're close. It is... Wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 Ford and Roosevelt. The also, other, the other Roosevelt. You're, you're close in that it's two dudes. They have something very big in common. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sideburns, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was one. So in the original run, the original black and white Rod Serling hosted run, they did an episode with Ghost Lincoln. Oh. So he wasn't a vampire hunter. Not a vampire hunter, which by the way, I have been re-listening to old episodes and I think you might owe us. <laughs> I think you might have promised to do one after episode 50 and we're at Ooh. like 60 now. 60, we're at 60. Good book. The movie was bad. On Twilight Zone, the original run, hosted by Rod Sterling, in season three, an episode called The Passers-By from 1961. Mm. And in this episode, it ends with a twist that you are not going to believe. Wait, 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 wait. Are you going to say spoiler alert? What if if our viewers haven't seen it? You're going to ruin an episode of The Twilight Zone for them? That's that's messed up. From 1960. Okay, let's just say. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it's in their queue. If you haven't gotten to the the past, I'll just say it's, it's, I've seen a number of the original Look, episodes. Look, I'm watching. I'm watching television. In, I like to watch my television in <laughs> Se- order sequentially. Yeah, sequentially. Yeah. So right now, I, I'm watching all of television, starting from obviously from the yeah. early 1940s, of course. Obviously, and, yes. and so I'm 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 only up to 1956. Yes. So please, no spoilers. Yeah, I'm still behind on my Today Show. <laughs> I'm, I'm still in my uh, Matt Lauer era. Jane. I'm not, not caught up yet. That's me doing the old <laughs> collar pull. Yeah. Where was I? Oh, the passersby from 1961. There is a twist at the end. Ben does not want me to spoil the twist, but I'll just say it does involve the revelation that a number of characters that we've seen passing by, hence the passersby, might not be living. <gasps> Maybe... Maybe it's people who we thought were living who are actually dead. Wait, and are you telling me that we've been seeing dead people? <laughs> I saw dead people. I watched the episode. And then one of these dead people turns out to be Abraham Lincoln. Mm. Ghost Lincoln. Does he have like a big 
like bullet hole through his head? No. Um, it takes place during the the you know that that war, the Civil War. Actually, after the Civil War, in the days after the Civil War, you're on a road watching all these soldiers, both Confederates and Union soldiers, walking home with the big question of what will they be returning to? Their lives have been devastated. And of course, what we eventually realize is it's not the road of the survivors we've been watching. It's the road of the dead. They're all dead too? John, are we... are we dead? Yes, my darling, like all those men on the road. They're the dead soldiers, the people who've given their lives to this lost cause. And the last person we see, the last death of the Civil War... Abraham Lincoln. ...is Abraham Lincoln. He only walks by and he quotes Julius Caesar from Shakespeare. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it'll come. That's from Shakespeare. Julius Caesar. And the second fictionalized real president from an episode of The Twilight Zone was in the 1980s, when oh. we got a time-traveling John F. No, Kennedy. No, time-traveling John F. Kennedy? Are you sure that was an episode of Quantum Leap? What, what, what do you mean, time, time-traveling John F. Kennedy? That's ridiculous. This one was from 1986, an episode called Profile in Silver, in which a they John... Did a lot, they did a lot of cocaine in the 80s. Yeah, this is a crazy story. That seems, that seems like a, a fever dream of an episode. It's a, a future John F. Kennedy who is not killed by assassination who sees what's become of his family and, and goes back in time to kill himself because he doesn't want to see what happens to his nephew, basically. It's like, whoa, hey oh. there. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it's the opposite. It's a future descendant of JFK in the far future. JFK Jr. Jr. Who goes back in time, because that's what historians do in the future. They actually go back in time to see history, which feels like cheating, but whatever. Uh, they go back. He goes back in time to witness when his ancestor was killed during... Was he on the grassy knoll? Was he on the grassy knoll? He was close enough... Grassy knoll adjacent. ...that even though he knows what's going to happen and he knows that he can't interfere, he can't help himself but yell, Duck! (laughs) Right before the shot's taken. So... He winds up saving uh, JFK's life. In fact, JFK is like... Then does he look at his hand and it slowly disappears? A little bit. Uh, JFK, he, he, he knows what happened. He heard the guy yell, duck. So he's like, I want that, that guy to save my life. Bring him to the White House. We'd be honored to have you as a guest by dinner tonight at the White House. And then another time traveler comes back and says to the first time traveler, who is a descendant of JFK. JFK Jr. 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 Dude, you just fucked everything up. Like... Because JFK survived, that puts us on a different course of history. Wait, how does that guy know that? Because they're all from the future and the new... But the don't future worry about changed. The, details. The, the future's changing, but these the time travelers exist outside of that timeline. So he's able to mm. say, look, we're now on a different timeline. And they turn on the news and they see that like over in Russia now, because JFK is not dead, all of a sudden like Khrushchev gets assassinated. Basically, because JFK doesn't die, it sets the world on the path to world war three nuclear war wait the so who wait, everything. khrushchev gets gets assassinated something instead? happens in russia that wouldn't have but happened it d- doesn't sound as good in the song nikita <laughs> khrushchev blown away what else do i have to say that makes it, no did, did they still have the billy joel song in it in in this episode well the episode was made in 86 had billy joel written that song yet and by 86 i think he was right maybe it wasn't recorded but he was writing it he might have been right. Yeah, it took a while. He's writing in real time as events yeah. happen. <laughs> oh, JFK blown away. <laughs> he writes that down in six. He's like, what else do I have to say? <laughs> oh, perfect. He's a few more verses. I'll give it a couple decades. Let's see what happens. Rock in the and 70s. roller color wars. But anyway, so he realizes, oh shit! By saving JFK's life, I've now doomed the entire human race. And he goes to JFK and he tells him what's going on. I'm a historian, Mr. President, sent here from over 200 years in your future to. Record and observe the events of your era. Why doesn't he just go further back in time? Well, I'm getting to the the real twist at the end here. Okay. And that is that when JFK hears what happened, he is so magnanimous as a human being that he says, well, I have to die. No, he didn't say it like that. Do it in a, do it in a Boston accent. Uh, Ash not. Uh, <laughs> I have to die. <laughs> <laughs> 
I parked the car on Harvard Square. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't do acts. You're the accent no, guy. No, you did it. You nailed it. You nailed it. You just needed, needed the, the coach, the pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, JFK says, oh, you have to send me back. And so he goes to take like the time travel like, watch or something that was send him back. And instead, what the time traveler does is he sends JFK, not back, but to the future. <gasps> and then the time traveler, because he's, remember, a descendant of JFK, sends himself back into the motorcade at the exact moment that the bullet goes off. So yeah, it's, cocaine. Cocaine. It's the descendant the who gets shot to the head. And then you, it ends in the future, future with JFK alive teaching history at Harvard. <laughs> Getting it on with coeds. Most Left likely, right. he's living it up. That's in the second run of The Twilight Zone, the third run of The Twilight Zone, which aired on UPN. They didn't do any fictionalized presidents. And then Ooh. comes Jordan Peele, a great filmmaker, coming off of Get Out. Get Out. And his feature film career, which Keanu. is reinventing the modern thriller. It's not horror film, thriller, horror film. This, this film's kind of straddled the... The line between the two. Yeah. For a while, CBS had been trying to do another version of The Twilight Zone. They couldn't quite get it going. They worked with a lot of big producers. And it's when Jordan Peele comes on that they actually were able to get it done for this brand new service called CBS All Access. What's that? That was the precursor to Paramount+. Plus. Oh, well, depending on when this uh, episode comes out, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Jordan Peele is the executive producer. The other executive producer whose name pops up a lot as helping get Simon, this thing going. Simon Kinberg. Who we talked about in our Triple X State of the Union episode because mm-hmm. he wrote that. This episode in particularly aired during its first batch of episodes. First season, yeah. Two seasons. It aired in 2019. Yes. And what can you tell me about this episode, Ben? Like who's in well, it? We- who made it? Yeah, well, it was uh, written by Andrew Guest, who's a writer on 30 Rock and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and maybe some other shows that have numbers in the title. So uh, it must be a lot of laughs in this episode. Yeah, a lot of laughs. Some comedy. There's some dark comedy. Directed by Richard Shepard. And this this episode, pretty good cast, I would say. We have John Cho, who plays a character named Raph Hanks, campaign manager, political campaign manager. We have Allison Tolman. We also have John Larroquette is in this episode. Yes. Kind of like a cameo. And Jacob Tremblay. Who you, you might remember from The Room. Room? No. Which is, room? The, which is the good one? Which is the bad one? Well, the, the Room is the cult classic. Okay. Room, I think, when Brie Larson, the, the Oscar. Yes. The Oscar. There's only one Oscar, <laughs> and Brie Larson has it. She's got the Oscar. She has it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like they, uh, each year when you think <laughs> that they win an Oscar, those are just... That's just Breeze. Those, are, those aren't real. You, can you have to actually fight the person who has <laughs> the Oscar. And Brie Larson uh, knows Krav Maga. I mean, well, I think what is great about this episode for us is that it has a ton of fake presidents in it. Two and a half by my count. Three and a half by my count. Really? Oh, well, there's one totally off screen. I don't know if I count that guy. He's we, just see, a, we see him. We know what they, we, we see a we photo. See how, see, how much people like. We see a photo. We see, a we see stock how he's photo. doing. We see how he's doing. Okay. We see a couple of stock photos. Yeah, well, let's, let's save it for the pod. This this is the pod. Later in the pod. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah a quick recap. Uh, not recap. A recap. <laughs> quick. You know when it doesn't come out the first time. <laughs> yeah. You think you got to go? Or when it, or the yo, it's, that's also known as the yo yo doo doo. I thought that was hedge. Is a, a recap. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, quick recap. The framing device of the episode is John Cho recalling the events that would lead up to him now being in a rather futuristic, dystopian, sci fi ish hospital room. Yes. Like yellow oval walls giant light over his head yeah it's a a very 1984 big brother-ish like sort of medical sort of alien maybe on a spaceship but anyway he's injured and he's recalling the events how did he get here those events begin on election day the previous election cycle five years earlier when he was the wonderkind because he is a wonderkind political consultant, campaign manager. Campaign manager. When we first meet him, 
He's talking with Alison Tolman about the fact that it's election day and he took one of the least popular presidents of all time and made it so that he is now the expected front runner coming out of this night's election. They never thought Stevens would get reelected, especially not with me running his campaign. They were wrong. Again, can you just not jinx things? Come on, you've seen the polls. You see the crowds? We took the most unpopular president in American history and we turned it around. I want Justin Timberlake to play me in the HBO movie. And then... They're called to the president's hotel room and they get totally reamed out by President James Stevens, John Larroquette. What the fuck, Rath? Mr. President? The thing I just lost, New York. Lost New Jersey. I'm from fucking New Jersey. I'm ah, Mr. Fucking New Jersey. No. We're losing the whole goddamn country. No, my dad is. Oh, your dad is horse shit. I listened to you. I listened to your numbers and your polls and your fancy data and your high tech baloney. I love it. I love John, John Larroquette. I'm going to cut away from the story for a second. In the fourth grade, we had like a, a celebrity auction, but we all had a right to celebrities to try to get stuff from them. And I wrote to John Larroquette because I mm. love Night Court. Same here. And John Larroquette sent five signed headshots. Ooh, wow. One, one was made out to me. He also wrote a very kind letter complimenting me on my name because I guess his son was also <laughs> named Benjamin. And I, was, I was like, John Larroquette, even in the fourth grade, I was like, you're one classy man. I think I can one-up you there, Ben. Yeah. So you got Harry? Go- you got a, I mean, did you get Mac? Who'd you get from Night Court? I was at a Starbucks a few weeks after AirPods first came out. You know, the Apple, yeah. Apple wireless, you know, earbuds. I'm wearing them while listening to a podcast. Not this podcast. Yeah. This is before this podcast existed. When someone should get my attention, flag me down, sitting a few seats over. Bull. No, it's John Larroquette. Come oh. on. Yeah. And I pull out one AirPod. I'm like, oh, hi. I didn't say like, hi, John Larroquette. I was like, oh, hi. Uh, and he's like, hey. Uh, how do those sound? I was thinking of getting some. Are they good for music? And so I say, well, John Larroquette. I don't say John Larroquette. I'm thinking, yeah. hey, John Larroquette. They sound great. I mean, I listen to mostly podcasts, though, so I can't speak the music, but they sound no different to me than the wired one. And he said, well, thank you. And then I put my little earbud back in, and I kept listening to my podcast, knowing that I just gave tech advice <laughs> to John Larroquette. But how many headshots did he sign for you? In the moment, none. This is like the best John, John Larroquette off ever i maybe steered him on a new path in life maybe he bought the airpods and he enjoyed them maybe he enjoyed them enough that it affected like how he approached work like he no longer felt tied to his phone via a wire so he unhooked a bit got a little more freedom between him and his his electronic devices and that freedom is what allowed him to make me myself and i the tv show that he did with Bobby Moynihan. Bobby Moynihan and another child actor like the new Jacob Tremblay. <laughs> Where was I? We were... Uh, oh, John Larroquette. John Larroquette, <laughs> yeah. Pre- President Stevens reams out John Cho. He's like... I am a one-term joke. I'm a diaper filled with baby shit and it is all your fault! Fuck! Very 30 Rock. Yes. Very Jack McDonough. Jack yeah, Donahue? Jack Donahue. Yeah. Yeah. And with this, Cho thinks that his career is over. But at the same time, like... The guy was the least was popular so, president. Yeah, the least popular president. Like, so, he must have done something well to make it, everybody think like he had a chance. But anyway, his, his career is ruined. Then we jumped again two years later at a bar. He's been out of the business. He's drinking away. And, and behind him on the TV, we find out that the new president is sucking hard. His <laughs> yeah. approval ratings on the economy are at 24%. On climate change, only a 12%, which is like kind of a weird stat, uh, 6% on crime, and 16% on foreign policy, where it's like, if you're only at 16% approval in for foreign policy, like, was the U.S. attacked and we did nothing? <laughs> like, we're just like, well, that happened. Let's yeah. keep on moving. But it just seems like everybody is it's, miserable. Everyone hates this guy. No one wants to go back to the guy from four years earlier either. But then up on TV pops up 11-year-old Oliver Foley, our, our man, our little man, Jacob Tremblay, a YouTuber yeah. who proclaims he's running for president because he wants people to be nice to each other and he wants video games in school <laughs> because it's helpful for hand-eye coordination. Oh, hey. Hi. I'm Oliver 
Henry Foley, and I'm announcing my candidacy for president of the USA. And this kid's going viral. And at the bar, all the patrons at the bar are like, I like that kid. I'd vote for him. That's, that's somebody I could trust. Considering all the crap coming out of Washington, vote for that kid in a heartbeat. Me too. I like what he's saying. He's a little cutie. And with that, John Cho, he sees his way back into the political world. So he shows up to the kid's house. Yeah. He has dinner with the family. And he tells them that he wants to run their campaign. What I like about this scene is they do address the biggest question on everyone's minds first. Which is how does an 11-year-old run for president of the United have, States? You have to be at least 35. How do they get around it, Ben? What is their plan to get around the age thing? His mom is going to be the one on the ballot. But little Oliver is the one who's going to have all the power. Yes, that's their plan. And I assumed at this point that... He was like some upstart third-party candidate who's just going to come racing in when you have two unpopular party candidates and just do what Ross Pro couldn't do and yeah. win. No, he's, he's, <laughs> he's running in, in the primary. In fact, the, the bulk of the episode takes place during the Iowa caucus. Uh, the Iowa caucus. But taking a step back, I want to okay. talk about something super quick. Okay. Oliver's parents think that it's a joke, right? That he's there and everything. And he, John Cho explains everything. And he's like, look, other political outsiders like Andrew Johnson, who was a tailor, and Teddy Roosevelt, who was a rancher, they both became president. You know, never mind that Andrew Johnson was also a mayor and a member of Congress. Teddy Roosevelt was also the governor of New York. And, yeah. and with the Teddy Roosevelt, I was like, oh, let me go into Wikipedia just to see what his background was. <laughs> and I found this small paragraph. His lifelong interest in zoology began age seven when he saw a dead seal at a market. <laughs> After obtaining the seal's head, Roosevelt and Cousins formed the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. Having learned the rudiments of taxidermy, he filled his makeshift museum with animals he killed or caught. I see where you're going with this, Ben. Are we sure this guy's not a Kennedy? He's, he's not a Kennedy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. That's fucking crazy. Yeah, that, I, I'm surprised that the Wikipedia would actually <laughs> explain things like that. I'm, I'm sure I should do more of my own research <laughs> to see if that's actually true. But from now on, I'm just going to believe that, that Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> bought a seal set at a market and then became a taxidermist. An anyway, elementary school age taxidermist who set yeah. up his own museum. Totally yeah. not a serial killer. <laughs> no. Teddy Roosevelt was not the midnight marauder that terrorized upstate New York for 12 years. That said... In the, I, late, in the late 1800s. The he time, was not the midnight marauder. Do the time frames work up? Could he have been Jack the Ripper? That was also late mm. 1800s. Yes. I mean, do we know if he's been to London or not? I mean, I've, I think we figured it out. I mean, that, that, that's a good true crime podcast. <laughs> Was Teddy Roosevelt Jack the Ripper? <laughs> okay. I mean, to be to be fair, to be fair, based off what we just learned about him, <laughs> probably we we're, we're we're not going to take him off the list. No. <laughs> this, this 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 is a presidential favor. Favor. So John Cho finally sells the idea that Oliver should run for president to Oliver's yeah. parents by saying like, "There's going to be endorsements. There's going to be book deals. Everybody wins. You're going to make money. Nobody gets hurt." Yeah. This is the American dream. Yeah, so I'm I'm thinking that at this point it might become, you know, maybe the tone of this episode is going to go towards like, uh, what's that movie where Michael J. Fox played the agent to like children? Life, like a, Life with Mikey. Life with Mikey, like that kind of a thing where now he's got to like basically be an agent for this kid. Yeah. And you get to experience like the celebrity side of politics. Yeah. But no, it, it digs into the actual politics politics. We see debate prep. <laughs> we, we see stump speeches. We see music videos. A Bieber-esque music video about yeah. voting. Oh, yeah. And we also find out a key piece of information. We do. Uh, at, at the uh, music video shoot. Because his parents tell little Oliver that he has to go see the doctor. You get the sense he doesn't like any doctors, but he in particular doesn't like this doctor. And Why yeah. then does he not like this doctor? Because he's an old man. <laughs> yeah. You're almost like, guys, I think we need to investigate this doctor. 
we, they're in Iowa for the bulk of the the mid part of this episode. Yeah, we, there, there's ups ups and downs. At, at no point do we actually see how an Iowa caucus works, which would be interesting and new. And I still think most people outside of Iowa have no idea what a caucus is, how it works. And yeah, I think the fourth version of the Twilight Zone really missed out <laughs> to explain to America how the I mean, Iowa caucus works. I mean, can we get Andrew Guest <laughs> here so we can talk with him about this? This is crazy. Uh, I, I'm just saying that if there's any parts of American politics that feel like they were invented by Rod Serling, because what, what, what's the, 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 the basic truth behind almost every Twilight Zone episode? The real monster is us, Ben. <laughs> the real monster is and your neighbors. Holds up, holds up a mirror. But we do get to see a debate, a primary debate between this young boy and presumably the same party candidates he's up against. Yeah, and he uh, he stinks. He shits the bed. <laughs> yeah, he does. I mean, I guess I don't really understand taxes, if that's really a question. I mean, taxes are good, except when they're bad. But they're mostly good, right? Um, he starts crying on stage. His mommy has a run he calls, up there. He calls, calls for his mommy. Which yeah. is not a good look. No. Not a good look. And for all intents and purposes, the episode's over because his career is over. And John Cho, you know what? He did okay. He got him this far. People are like, look. Look, dude, Raph, you got this kid further than anyone thought you would. You should be proud. But Raph thinks, now he believes. He thinks he could have gotten this kid farther. And he goes back and talks to Oliver, young Oliver, young Jacob Tremblay, to see what's going on. And what does he find out? Why was he so off his game on debate night? Because his dog was dying. Oh, his dog was dying. They think they could use this dying dog. So Oliver vlogs about it. And that tugs on the heartstrings of all the Iowans in yeah. Iowa. And he pulls off the W. Yeah, he's the real comeback kid here. Yeah. He wins the Iowa caucus. And then he wins the presidency. Technically, his mom wins the presidency. His mother, <laughs> Helen, wins the presidency. We see the parade. We see Oliver in the Oval Office. He jumps on the desk. And right then, he wants to get to business. He's the president now. He made promises. He wants to fulfill those promises. And what is the first promise he wants to check off that big old list, Eric? A video game for every American. Yes. It's like the game a, or game system? I, video game. Video games are for free. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the game. Not the, yeah, you don't get the, you gotta, you gotta pay for the system. <laughs> Which he does get a considerable amount of pushback from his parents, from yeah. the staffers that are there. And they're like, we gotta, you gotta go through Congress. Power, power of the purse. I'm surprised they didn't talk about that, Eric. That would have been a, a great opportunity to <laughs> just stop the episode in its tracks and explain the separation of powers between the three levels of government and uh, the checks and balances that are involved in that. Don't you think that could have been, that was a teachable moment that was lost? Lost not just for Jacob Tremblay, but also for America. Yeah. And everyone watching on CBSL <laughs> Access at the time. But he doesn't care because he's like, get, the, get these companies to do it. Otherwise, I'll stick a surcharge on them and put them out of business. Like, in, it, like a tariff? Like a tariff. And then you know what he wants? An ice cream sundae. Oh, yeah. We also see him auditioning, meeting new dogs. Yes. To replace his dying dog. We uh, also see uh, just penguins roaming the lawn yeah. of the White House. I guess they had some extra video effects money. I don't know. And uh, he installed a swing in, in the, the Oval, Oval office, office. Yes. Where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is just pushing him. Over the course of just a couple of minutes, it's a little montage -y. We go yeah. from seeing him on his first day getting pushed back about this ridiculous idea to now everyone seems to be doing everything that he's saying. And the only person who thinks anything is weird going on is John Cho, who thinks yeah. this kid is maybe... Because remember, this kid still doesn't go to the doctor. He still doesn't like it. He still... No, in fact, in, fact, he wants an, in fact, he wants a new law. Yeah. No old doctors. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. Wait, wait, like when you hear that out loud... I could get behind that. I mean, that's oh. not like crazy. Wait, like, like I've heard stories where like friends of my wife or whatever, they said people go to this gynecologist in Beverly Hills who's like 70, he's a 75 year old man. I was like, that's <laughs> weird. Yeah. You know what? 70, no old doctors. That's great. Airline pilots have a forced retirement. Yeah. You know? they, he could spin that. I think he can make that happen. But yet that's where John Cho stops, kind of stops believing. And yeah. so he goes to two people to try to just poke around to see what's going on. Yeah. 
the Go first person the, to talk to Sarah's? The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Who has a great response. He's like, what are you talking about? Everyone loves them. <laughs> they love their video games. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves the video games. And then uh, he accuses John Cho of some uh, light treason. <sighs> Approval ratings through the roof. Everybody loves their video games. Strange time to be talking treason, Hanks. And then he goes to Oliver's mom, who is the president. Yeah, he said, you're the president. You can make this... Whatever you want to happen, you can make happen. He's kind of got to listen to you. You're both his mom and the president. And the president. But no, she is proud of her son. Meanwhile, we are cutting back to the hospital room where futurist John Cho is in great pain. He's been he's, injured. He's, he's bleeding. bleeding. Yeah. People keep saying that the president wants him to have the best care. Doctor's on the way. I keep thinking at this point, oh, I, I know what the twist is. I think I know what the twist is. You're being coy with the word president. I think I know what's going on. Hmm. But anyway, the episode continues. And uh, instead of uh, just talking to people who surround the president, John Cho goes directly to the boy himself. Yeah. Who is now in the presidential putting room. Yes. Who President Oliver says he believes Nixon put in the green. And while it's just a putting green, he wishes it was more uh, mini golfish. He wished there were some some little loop-de-loops and... And some, some tricks. Who wants to just putt? I want windmills and pirate ships. Those little pencils to keep track. As he's putting around, the Secret Service men behind him, and he, he can't sink any putts. It just makes him angrier and angrier that he can't sink any putts. And you know what also makes him angry? He knows about the treason. I'm not being treasonous, Oliver. I'm just worried about a few things. There is a difference. And what does he admit in this scene to John Cho? What, do, what does he admit? That the dying dog was never dying. Oh, yes, that the dying dog was never dying. It was all an act. John Cho got played. Is that the twist, Ben? The fact that John Cho got played? No, we're not there yet. (laughs) No. Oliver just, he rips into John Cho for not backing him unconditionally. He's just throwing a temper tantrum after after not getting a hole in one. And then he throws some balls on the ground and a ball goes in the hole and sees, there, I got a hole in one. But John Cho says, you didn't get a hole in one. And Oliver says... Yes, I did get a hole-in-one. Tell me I got a hole-in-one, John Cho. I've said it was a hole-in-one, and I'm president. Do you support me, or are you treasonous? It's a two plus two is five moment from Big Brother 1984. And John Cho, no. The truth is the truth. Democracy dies in darkness, Ben. And John Cho isn't going to lie anymore. With that. The president only has one word, <laughs> one word, one last trick up his little tiny sleeves. Gun. <laughs> so that yelled. the Secret Service just like goes to town on John Cho. Yeah, he yells gun as, as if to imply that John Cho pulled a gun on him. Yeah. And even though they can see there's no gun. Well, well, and also typically it's the Secret Service that yells gun. We did it in the line of fire. We know how the Secret yeah. Service works. But yeah, so they shoot. They shoot John Cho, and that's when we go back to the operating room. And yeah, that's when the, the doctor is finally ready to help him. If it's not clear, Cho has been Swiss cheesed. He's full of bullets. He's bleeding out. He's injured. And the president just wants him to get the best care possible. And here's why I couldn't understand if what happens next. Is it what Tremblay really thinks is the best care possible? Or is it just another punishment for the treason? I, I don't know what, what medical school the doctor went to, but... This doctor, though, ain't an old man, because that's illegal. He's a kid. (laughs) Yeah. But not like a Doogie Howser. He's not a Doogie Howser. No. He's pre-Doogie. Yeah, this was a missed opportunity, because it's clearly another, like, 12-year-old. And it would have been fitting if we had, like, met, like, one of Tremblay's friends earlier. And it was, like, the one friend who... Who, like, likes to play Operation. Yeah, some... Who who likes to cut open animals. That's Teddy Roosevelt. (laughs) Oh, Oh, this kid's name should be Teddy. That's what it should be. His friend, meet my friend Teddy. He's got the most amazing hobby. The episode ends yeah. with this kid, kid doctor, basically torturing John Cho. Yeah, it ends with him screaming clearly because this doctor does not know how to find <laughs> the many, many bullets that are still in his body. And that's how it ends. Yeah, Tremblay's still the president. I see. I, I thought the twist was going to go back to the fact that the mom was still the president. And that the mom was still somehow, because she was profiting off all of this, she was trying to keep Cho silent. But no, that's not what no. was going on. Kid, kid doctors. How yeah. dare you come into this office and bark at me like some little junkyard dog? I am the president of the United States. So let's talk about the president, Ben. The first fake president. 
Lero Kett. What party do we think this guy? It's, it's kind of hard to figure it out, but I think he's a Democrat because he expected to win New York and New Jersey. But yet when we go up into the campaign headquarters, they're watching a very red news channel, very red coded, yeah. which is differing from when eventually we go into the Oliver campaign where the news channels they're watching are very blue coded. And we know Oliver has a Rachel Maddow interview scheduled. Yeah, but but that's what I'm saying, right? If we're, we're doing flip floppy, so Stevens loses, faceless, nameless president who has only got a 12% approval rating on the climate. He's got to be a Republican because then we have the primary process right. with Oliver. If Oliver is a Democrat based off of that, then Stevens would be a Democrat. And, and John Cho probably works with only certain parties as well. Are we certain that the incumbent is running for re-election, though? Because when we do meet some talking heads representing the average voter, they don't like their choices before Tremblay enters. Like, is there a world where they're I, running to take the spot of the incumbent on the incumbent's party side? I mean, looking at the people who are running against Oliver, the middle-aged black woman wearing a blue dress, to me, that would be a Democrat. Oh, like a Stacey Abrams type? Yeah. She was watching Buffy and <laughs> writing her romance helping novels. register people to vote, saving, saving the world, saving, saving the country. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so that's why I think the first president was a Democrat. Democrat. Which would make, and you think, therefore, Tremblay must also be a Democrat because they're both running against the same person. Correct. A couple of reasons also why I think he's Democrat. If we look at his stump speech. Here are the 10 things. I promise the American people if I'm elected president. Number one, jobs. Jobs for everyone. He promises jobs for everyone. To me, we could do that. That's that's and that, that's a very Dave thing. The the Jobs very, Act. Very Dave. Pro it's Dave. also something a Republican and a Democrat would both say. Yeah. Number two, long weekends, longer vacations. Longer vacations. That, to me, that's more Democrat. Well, it is if he's Frenchy, like four day work week. Four day work the, week. Come if on. The, no, if the idea is to go through unions. Yeah. I can totally see that being a democratic position. But if your idea of longer weekends means you're cutting the amount of hours people can work because you don't want to, to pay overtime, because <laughs> you want to eliminate yeah. overtime as a thing, then it becomes, uh, you know, not so much of a, a, a democratic liberal position. Well, what, what if by longer vacations, he means uh, universal basic income? Or by longer vacations, he means... Bringing back, bringing back <laughs> Columbus Day. Yeah. <laughs> Number three, less Star Wars movies. He also wanted less Star Wars, which then might make him Republican. He might be going full like incel with his yeah. view on Star Wars based off on the last few movies. Number four, better air to breathe, which means more bikes and less cars. He wants better air to breathe? unless he's a Nixon. He, he, he brings up Nixon later. Yeah. So maybe he's a conservationalist Republican, but still it seems more like a, a Democratic t talking point. Number five, last war. Number six, dog for dog people and cats for cat people. Number seven, more pancake houses throughout the land, please. Number eight, three video games for every American. Number nine, every month has to have its own holiday. Number ten, dessert is the food game. And then the president, that is just a headshot on screen. We never meet. Do we even get a name for him? Nothing. I was trying to look into the background of a couple of scenes. I couldn't even see it. Yeah, we get nothing on that guy except the fact that but no one that likes he is, him. But he is a, as bad as Stevens was, as bad as Larry Kett was. Yeah. This guy, man. Whew. Which is not common. Because usually the economy is cyclical enough. That you don't get two presidents in a row where everyone's like, I'm out on this dude. Also, how bad could the climate have become for only for 12% approval? In about two years. I mean, did he allow yeah. like a three-mile island to happen? Yeah, like so, but but I'm gonna stick with with Stevens, Democrat, the guy who everybody hates even more than Stevens, Republican. Okay. Oliver Democrat. is a Democrat. That's kind of what we have to go with. Although I still feel like Stevens was coded more Republican. The idea that this kid was ever in a party to begin with, why wasn't he a third party? Why did he have to go to the primary process? Like, if you're going to be that much of a fantasy... I mean, it was this was the perfect chance for the Twilight Zone to explain how third party candidates can get on the ballot in all 50 states. <laughs> 
If they could have just spent like a good 15, 20 minutes explaining the process. The number of signatures that you need in each state is a little different. I mean, the Twilight Zone is all about teachable moments. Ow! Because I'm the goddamn president of the United States of America. What does this TV episode say about the year it was made? 2019. Here's what's interesting, though, is about that time period. There's a very, let's say, a distinctive president in the office. We didn't really get Trumpian fake presidents until he left office. And even then, Meryl Streep is kind of it. And don't look up. No, no, you're forgetting Nick Offerman in Civil War. Okay. But anyway, having a kid in the White House who has a, a hot temper and can only be soothed by having some ice cream. Um, yeah, it's quite Trumpian. When you, when you lay it out in broad terms, it feels like they're definitely doing that. But watching it, maybe because it's not 2019 and I'm watching it in 2024, it also kind of lines up with the politics of our time where you have, a, at one point, there were two older candidates. Yes. And there was a, a, a massive desire for something much, much younger. But yeah, back, back to 2019. I can see where on paper the tantrums the childish outlook, the complete misunderstanding of how things are going, the idea that people are scared to criticize this person. Um, the idea know. that you could you could shoot somebody or have somebody shot <laughs> and get away <laughs> with it. It didn't ultimately it didn't work as a political satire to me because it felt like this Jacob Tremblay character. They didn't properly address how he could become president. Like it tried to really balance the line between like fable and fantasy, but also like cautionary tale you know, without really settling in on one side of that line that I, I was unable to look at its portrayal. And like, if you told me the script was like the first script they'd written in like 2014 while they're still developing the show and just got made in 2019, you'd be like, yeah, I can see that. Like to me, like I said, it felt more like a sequel to an earlier episode from the 60s, the one about the all-powerful kid who when he nods can like, turn people into like jack in the boxes and send them to the field. And Ooh. you know, you haven't seen that one. No, I, I told you I'm only up to 1956. <laughs> it's called, it's a good life. It's about a child with mm -hmm. these amazing powers who is a child and uses them like a child really would to the point where every adult is scared the shit to interact with this kid. Because if you don't have exactly what he wants, when he wants it, he will throw a tantrum. And that tantrum could result in you ceasing Coming to exist. Being turned into, if he wants a toy and you don't have the toy, you become the toy. And so this kind of felt like a spiritual successor to that. Or like an homage. An homage. You know, ultimately it didn't work as a political satire to me. I guess here's where it falls apart. The twist ending. I get that even if the character was directly inspired by, at the time, the current inhabitant of the White House based off of some criticisms of that person that I will not go on the record as repeating as my own opinions myself because I have no opinions about anyone who currently holds the office or may hold the office at the time in the future when you're listening to this. I feel it's only my civic duty to not take a stand there. That's why uh, your nickname is uh, the LA Times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's also sometimes I call you WAPO. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but uh, no, no, but so even if you were to see all those parallels, who's John Cho? What is the ending? Like, what are they? Who is dying here? What does the the young doctor represent? That is this twist. Like, like when I think of Twilight Zone episodes that have really something to say about their times, I think like to serve man. I think about the uh, Eye of the Beholders, the one where the the beautiful woman is considered ugly in a, in a world where everyone literally has a pig snout. But with this one, the ending it felt so disconnected from what came before it, except for like lining up with just like, you know, this, those two lines about not liking old doctors. So because of that disconnect, I couldn't really figure out ultimately what the big ironic twist was supposed to be doing. It didn't feel that ironic. Uh, it, it wasn't making you reassess the first 35 minutes that you saw before it, nor did it really make me reconsider my own reality. So I guess I have to say that this episode to me didn't feel like it ultimately had anything specific to say about 2019. I don't know. I think it says something in terms of what people want, what an electorate wants from a candidate. And it's like, ultimately, like, do they care about key issues or do they just care about, you know, getting some free video games? It's like, okay, like, we'll put up, we'll put up with this kid doing all this other shit as long as we get the stuff. But that's just it. So ultimately, 
if the message is be careful what you wish for, well, th- what the people got what they wish for, and they're all happy. As the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staffs testifies to, people are happy with this kid. Everyone's happy with this kid. Only John Cho isn't, which is another Twilight Zone cliche. Is the whole world crazy but me? Yeah. It's kind of what John Cho winds up in. But I, I couldn't figure out who his real world parallel would be. Like, like yes, there are there were definitely times during the four years between 2017 in 2021, where you could turn on the TV, like, am I the only one seeing this? Because what's going on here is crazy. But we were saying that because of actual real world things happening that certain people seem blinded to. Whereas in this case, John Cho ultimately is taking issue with this president's policies, but the policies seem to be working. So basically what I'm saying is, maybe it is treason. (laughs) He was asking for it. Motherfucker, I'm not asking if you're interested. I'm the president of the United fucking States, man. Approval ratings, Ben, and legacy. I mean, I think his approval ratings, it's got to be up in the 80s. After the previous eight years of presidents who were deeply hated, who had failures left and right, who oversaw a world where there was war and maybe smog everywhere and the crime, people were being ravaged by crime. Maybe all anybody needed just to, like, stop that was just some video games. Keep people off the streets. So I'd probably say his approval rating, close to 90%. You know who he doesn't pull well with, though? Old doctors. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, I have an exact number. Yeah. 88. 88%. Do you see in the background? No. Uh, It's because in every age of politics, there are floors and ceilings to these things. Typically in, like, the 30s. You know, no matter who the president is, at least in today's modern age, you'll never see one in the 20s. Yeah. And you'll probably never see one in the 50s again unless we, like, have a war or something. But, you know, there are floors well, and ceilings. we'll see what I mean after tonight. We'll see. But we already saw a floor slash ceiling established in the polling that you mentioned for the previous presidents. Yeah. 12% for climate. The fact that 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 president had a 12% approval rating means that that person has 12% of the population who are all in on that dude. (laughs) Yeah. 12%. Actually, actually, I like, actually, I like my air a little chunky. (laughs) Yeah. So that's 12%. You probably might not ever be going for a president Tremblay. So that's why I'm going for 88% approval. He can't win over that 12%. And then legacy. I mean, it's pretty easy. (laughs) <laughs> video games for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Video games for everybody. Uh, he might be the first U.S. president to sit on Vladimir Putin's lap. Yeah. Ride, ride a horse with him together. I, I could see that as part of his foreign policy. I think a child president, like a psychotic child president, would have a great relationship with Putin and probably with North Korea. Yeah. So we know he's a first termer. Does he get a second term? I guess that's. Hundred. I think the question is whether they they give him a third term and a fourth term. Yeah. Look, he could have multiple terms, right? Mom runs the first time, runs again. Dad runs the <laughs> yeah. next two times. Six. He could go sixteen years. That puts him at uh, twenty eight when he's out of office. He could probably find two more people until he gets to thirty five and run for himself. By the way, we never found out who his vice president is. That's a good question. Who do you think his vice president would be? Who would he choose? His dad. His dad? I think they really missed an opportunity to, to show us how a presidential candidate chooses their VP. They could have had all the different meetings. They could have shown the vetting <laughs> process. I mean, that's something that I think viewers of the Twilight Zone <laughs> would really want to see. Yeah. This has been fake presidents. Yeah. Has been fake presidents. Theme music by Johnny Sadoff. Artwork by Ann Hecker. You could find us at fake underscore presidents on various social media platforms. Definitely email us, no underscore, fake presidents, all one word, at gmail.com. We would like to do a mailback episode, and so we'd like to hear from you. Yeah. And also, please rate, review, subscribe, all that stuff is always Very important. really nice for us because we enjoy validation. Yes, we love validation. But you know who loves validation more than us? Oh, moms. That's true. And they can only leave so many reviews. 
they need the help propping us up. Help our moms out. Find some makers. Until well, next time. See you in a couple weeks. Bye. And have a happy, happy Halloween. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, well, till next time. Till next time, if there is a next time. Whoa. I guess there is the, with the election in two weeks, that's a fair, fair thing to say. We could get banned. We might be on the list. <laughs> I feel like you did such a good job establishing your MAGA credentials in our Star Trek episode, <laughs> in our Star Trek episode, that, uh, that might have, that might have staved off the secret police in the concentration camps for a bit. Well, the J, look, look, I just want to thank all our, all of our J6 contingency like we yeah. love your support we love uh everything you write to us on patreon we couldn't do this without you the way you come to our sub stack the way uh well, let's just say they, they could download the episodes with more regularity for some reason <laughs> they're not so great at keeping I up i think they that. share they, they they share they they only yeah. have they only have so many tablets uh in in prison